In this video, I'll be reading from Edward Edinger's The Aeon Lectures, Exploring the Self in C.G. Jung's Aeon. This is Chapter 3, Paragraphs 1 through 12. The Ego. Aeon begins with a chapter on the ego. This book is built in the same way the psyche is. So naturally, it starts with the ego, which we encounter first when we start to deal with the psyche in ourselves or in someone else. Jung begins the first paragraph with a good definition. We understand the ego as the complex factor to which all conscious contents are related. It forms, as it were, the center of the field of consciousness, and insofar as this comprises the empirical personality, the ego is the subject of all personal acts of consciousness. The relation of a psychic content to the ego forms the criterion of its consciousness, for no content can be conscious unless it is represented to a subject. Jung then goes on to describe how the ego rests on two different bases, the somatic and the psychic. In paragraph 6, he says, It, the ego, seems to arise in the first place from the collision between the somatic factor and the environment, and once established as a subject, it goes on developing from further collisions with the outer world and the inner. We use the term ego very freely, indeed glibly, but we shouldn't, because as we reflect on the ego, on what it is, and on its very existence, we see that it is a profound mystery. We can only define it as the center of consciousness. All consciousness must be registered by an ego in order to exist. We have not been aware of the ego's existence for very long. So far as the history of Western culture is concerned, full consciousness of the ego was discovered by René Descartes. Of course, there had been some sense of individual conscious identity before then, but full awareness of the ego was discovered by him and described in his Discourse on Method, published in 1637. Descartes started out his philosophical reflections by doubting the existence of everything. He said that for all we know, some malevolent deity put us into a dream state so that everything we see is no more than an illusion or fantasy, and that we can't really be sure that anything exists except for one thing that is absolutely certain. We can't doubt the existence of our own ego. His expression of that was cogito ergo sum, commonly translated as, I think, therefore I am, which is not quite accurate. A better translation would be, I am conscious, therefore I am. This is the bedrock foundation of every individual's existence. We can't deny that the ego exists because it is the seat of consciousness. Anything else can be denied. A person who was well-educated and had some knowledge of Latin had a dream related to this. The dream was a Latin sentence that started out with Descartes' statement, cogito ergo sum, and continued with ergo scivio deo gratias, deus est, which means I am conscious, therefore I am, therefore I know by God's grace that God is. That is an interesting addition that the modern unconscious has made to Descartes' discovery of the ego. The Cartesian discovery of the ego reoccurs in the childhood of the individual. The young child at first refers to itself in the third person, and then, perhaps at about the age three, starts to use the pronoun I. 
But that does not mean that the child has conscious awareness of the ego. That only comes later, if it comes at all. For Jung, it came about the age of 11. Here is his account. I was taking the long road to school from Klein Hunnigan, where we lived, to Basel, when suddenly for a single moment I had the overwhelming impression of having just emerged from a dense cloud. I knew all at once, now I am myself. It was as if a wall of mist were at my back, and behind that wall there was not yet an I. But at this moment I came upon myself. Previously I had existed too, but everything had merely happened to me. Now I happened to myself. Now I knew I am myself now. Now I exist. Previously I had been willed to do this and that. Now I willed. This experience seemed to me tremendously important and new. There was authority in me. Footnote, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, page 32. What Jung describes here with particular clarity happens only dimly to some people, and to many it does not happen at all. For myself, I had no clear-cut single experience that would correspond to the one Jung describes. I do remember around the age of 11 or 12 becoming fascinated with the word I and its meaning. I would repeat the word again and again until dark. Mysterious vistas would open up. The whole notion of being a separate, conscious individual, a carrier of unique consciousness set apart from the world, took on a profound mystery for me, which was revealed just by the repetition of the word I. The next philosophical elaboration on this subject was by Schopenhauer, following Kant. He was an important author for Jung. This is how Schopenhauer starts his masterpiece, The World as Will and Representation. The world is my representation. This is a truth valid with reference to every living and knowing being although man alone can bring it into reflective, abstract consciousness. If he really does so, philosophical discernment has dawned on him. It then becomes clear and certain to him that he does not know a sun or an earth, but only an eye that sees a sun, a hand that feels an earth, that the world around him is there only as representation. In other words, only in reference to another thing, namely that which represents, and this is himself. If any truth can be expressed a priori, it is this, for it is the statement of that form of all possible and conceivable experience, a form that is more general than all others, than time, space, and causality, for all these presuppose it. The division into subject and object is the common form of all those classes. Everything that in any way belongs and can belong to the world is inevitably associated with this being conditioned by the subject, and it exists only for the subject. The world is representation. Footnote, the world as will and representation, page 3. This theme that Schopenhauer elaborates so vividly is the distinction between subject and object. It is a critical theme for Jungian psychology, an idea at the core of Jung's typology of extroversion and introversion. The extrovert is the one who naturally and spontaneously relates to the object. The introvert naturally and innately relates primarily to the subject. It has been my experience that this distinction is easier for an introvert to perceive than for an extrovert. In fact, I often have the feeling that extroverts really don't get it at all.
but it is absolutely necessary to be able to differentiate between subject and object if one is to distinguish oneself consciously from the collective soup, from the state of participation mystique with the world and all the objects that are in it. Keenness of distinction between subject and object is an aspect of the well-developed ego. As Jung tells us in this chapter, the ego as the subject of consciousness has two aspects. The ego is the seat of perception or consciousness, and it is also the agent of the will. This brings up the whole problem of free will to which Jung refers in paragraph nine. The ego is by definition subordinate to the self and is related to it like a part to the whole. Inside the field of consciousness, it has, as we say, free will. By this, I do not mean anything philosophical, only the well-known psychological fact of free choice, or rather the subjective feeling of freedom. But just as our free will clashes with necessity in the outside world, so also it finds its limits outside the field of consciousness in the subjective inner world, where it comes into conflict with the facts of the self. And just as circumstances or outside events happen to us and limit our freedom, so the self acts upon the ego like an objective occurrence which free will can do very little to alter. Footnote. Readers will note the translators of Aeon did not capitalize the word self when it refers to the archetype. In this book, as in most current Jungian writing, it is capitalized throughout in order to avoid confusion with the mundane ego self. Editors. Another way of describing free will is to define it as the libido disposable by the ego. This is of considerable importance, both for self-understanding and in work with patients. One needs to have an estimate, at least an approximation, of the extent of one's own free will and the extent of the patient's free will. No one can be expected to take responsibility for something that is clearly outside the range of his or her free will. In paragraph 11, Jung tells us that the ego's freedom is limited by its dependence on the unconscious. With the discovery of the self, the position of the ego, till then absolute, became relativized. That is to say, Though it retains its quality as the center of the field of consciousness, it is questionable whether it is the center of the personality. It is part of the personality, but not the whole of it. As I have said, it is simply impossible to estimate how large or how small its share is, how free or how dependent it is on the qualities of the extra conscious psyche. We can only say that its freedom is limited and its dependence proved in ways that are often decisive. In my experience, one would do well not to underestimate its dependence on the unconscious. Naturally, there is no need to say this to persons who already overestimate the latter's importance. Some criterion for the right measure is afforded by the psychic consequences of a wrong estimate, a point to which we shall return later. That last sentence deserves emphasis. I think it is an important one for analytic work. Some criterion for the right measure is afforded by the psychic consequences of a wrong estimate. Now, what does that mean? I think it is calling for an experimental approach. If I don't know for sure the extent of a patient's free will, I can put it to the test. I can try out a certain attitude and then observe the psychic consequences. If my estimate has been wrong, then I can correct it. It is most important to keep an empirical attitude in the matter. 
then one is free to experiment. As long as one is conscious, what one does is always correctable. First, we must ask ourselves, how much free will does the ego we are talking to have? Then, at any given time, we must also ask ourselves the related question, to whom are we speaking? The fact that the person is in front of us and looking at us and may even be smiling does not necessarily mean we are speaking to the ego. We may be speaking to a complex. We may be speaking to the shadow, to the anima or animus, or even to the self or some combination. Even in the course of an interchange, the energy to which we are speaking, the who, can fluctuate. This is something always to be kept in mind so we can change our manner of speaking accordingly.